Okay, well, <clears throat> let me jump to the new stuff. We are going to implement a collection today. We're basically going to write a crappy version of Vector together as a group. And hopefully we'll learn something about how collections are implemented by doing that. So why are we going to do this? What's the point? I mean, I kind of said, said what? We've used a lot of these collections. I hope that by now you guys think those collections are useful, right? I mean, they've helped you implement lots of programs by now. And um, of course, we want to know how things really work. It's, it's a shame to just use these blind and not understand what they're really doing. And they're, they're structures that we can understand using what we've learned so far. So I think we, we ought to look at that and figure that out. And I think the way that we're going to figure that out for the most part is we're going to actually write sort of primitive versions of these things. We're going to write our own vector and write our own map and so on. And yeah, that's the plan. So, okay, to do this, I'm going to write a vector with you guys, but to do that, I want to talk about arrays first because a vector has an array inside of it. You notice we haven't used arrays really in the class so far, but let's talk about them now. Here is the syntax for creating an array. It's actually very, very similar to the Java syntax for creating an array. In Java, it looks just like that, except you say type, type bracket bracket name equals a new type. In C++, you say type star name equals new type. So uh, like an example of that would be, um, let me just open up a, a file here. Uh, here, uh, uh, gedit, that's my text editor. How about, no, key. What? No. Okay. So if you say, if you wanted an array of 10 integers, you just say like int star nums equals new int 10. And now you have like an array with 10 things in it, you know, 10 slots. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And now you can say like nums bracket 4 equals 17. And so that goes to, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, goes to here and sets this to 17, right? And so it, it behaves the way, for the most part, that you would expect an array to behave if you remember those from Java or Python or whatever else that you've learned. Um, that's the syntax. Now, in Java, it would have been int bracket bracket nums. That's the only difference so far in the syntax. But here in C++, it's int star. Why is it a star? It has something to do with a thing called pointers. And if you ask me what a pointer is, I'll say, I'll tell you when you're older. <laughs> Not much older, probably a couple of days older, but not today. Let's, let's come back to that. We can do what we need to do today without talking about that. And uh, yeah, that's, I want to wait a little bit longer before we talk about that, what that means. But um, <clears throat> anyway, that's how you create an array. There's two ways to create an array, though. Uh, one variation is after the, the length of the array, you can put parentheses. The difference between the two is that the one with the parentheses sets all the elements to zero. And the one without the parentheses doesn't set them to anything, which means that they store arbitrary random contents. So like you'll notice that in my picture on the slide here, or on the, on the notepad here, I left these ones blank. Because basically, I don't know what value they would have. Because literally, C++ just goes to your computer's memory and grabs some memory and says, OK, your array is going to be right here. And Whatever was in that memory, whatever those ones and zeros were set to, it just leaves it that way. So whatever numbers might have been sitting there before, that's what's in your array. Kind of weird. In Java, when you make an array, it's all zeroed out. And so the designers of Java decided that was better because it made it have less bugs or something. But in C++, they said, well, that's slower to initialize it to zero. If you want it to be zero, you just put parentheses here. Now all of these slots that I didn't set have zeros in them. Okay. So those are the two ways to construct an array. Um, now, one interesting difference between C++ and Java is that C++ has what we call manual memory management, which you're going to love. Let me just tell you. Uh, it means that when you create arrays, they will not be um, cleaned up when the program is done using them. You have to manually tell the program to clean them up. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, the syntax is on the slide here. The syntax, the syntax is not very complicated. It's just, you know, here I use this. I set nums to 14. I use it for something, whatever. Eventually, later on in my program, I decide I'm done with this array. I don't need it anymore. So now I have to write delete array nums. Now, what happens if I don't do that? Well, 
It's not the worst thing in the world. It's something that we call a memory leak. And I'm going to talk more about that later also. But I guess what I would say is when your program exits, when it goes back to Qt Creator, when the window closes and all that, regardless of whether you deleted and freed these up, the memory is reclaimed. So it's not that your computer's memory is claimed forever or something. It's just that if you had a program that ran for a long time that didn't terminate for days and days, maybe it's a server or something, or maybe you allocate a lot of arrays for some reason, if you never deleted them and freed them up, your program size would bloat because the program hadn't shut down yet, and eventually you would exhaust all the memory on the computer. And so we don't want to do that. So I think typically the, the idea here is when we're done using an array, when we're sure that we're done with it, we have to delete it. We have to say that we're done. It's just one little thing we have to put in our code. We have to be sure to put. Okay. But that'll, that, you know, right now, like I can write plenty of code that uses arrays and not call this delete thing. The only time it's really an issue is if we allocate a lot of arrays or if we have a long running program. That's when it becomes more important. Yeah. Is that only applicable to arrays? Or do you worry about other things too? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Like, why are we just talking about this now? Don't, do we have to do that if I allocate a hash map or a vector or something? Like, do I have to do this there? Um, no, you don't need to do this in any of the stuff we've learned so far. And the reason for that is because all the stuff we've learned so far has been from, like, Stanford libraries. And the Stanford libraries have code in them that cleans them up for you. So we kind of took care of that so that we could save this discussion for today. <laughs> if we hadn't given you the libraries, we would have had to talk about this bullshit on day two or something. And it's just not that interesting. It's not you know, the core stuff we needed to do in week one. So the libraries allowed me to wait till now to talk about this, basically. But now that we're playing with raw arrays, we have to do this ourselves. This is one of the many, many, many reasons why we didn't just start out using arrays at the first moment when we were playing with data. And we used a vector instead. Okay. Anyway, that's the syntax for freeing up an array. You only have to use it with arrays, not other things. Um, so a vector. Let's talk about what is really going on inside of a vector. I think I mentioned this a little bit before, but let's really talk about it now. A vector internally stores an array. The elements that you put in the vector are in an array. Now, the, the, uh, the model of how you think of a vector is it's like an array that grows and shrinks to be exactly the right size. Right? Initially, it's empty. You add something. Now its size is 1. You add another thing, the size is two. So you think of it as like this stretchable array that grows and shrinks. But if you really think about it, if you actually implemented it that way, it would be slow. Because arrays, you can't really resize arrays. Once you make them, that's the size that they are. And so if you wanted the array to be exactly the right size all the time, you would have to make a new array and copy everything in and out every time you added or removed something. That would be very slow. So what the vector really does internally is it makes some array that's bigger than your actual data. Like if you say I want a new vector it has nothing in it, you think of the size as being zero, but maybe it'll make an array of size 10. And it's kind of like I've got 10 slots available to fill. And as you add things, it'll put them in the next available slot. And if you get all done with all 10 of them and then you try to add an 11th one, only at that moment will it grow the array to be bigger. So it periodically grows as it runs out of capacity, OK? That's what's going on. We sometimes call this an unfilled array because not all the slots have meaningful data. Slots uh, three through nine there aren't actually storing elements. We want to say that the vector has three elements. The size is three. If you ask for the element at index six, I shouldn't give you the zero out. I should say there isn't an element at index six. I should probably crash you with an exception or something. That's, you know, that's internal state. That's not for the user to look at. So that's how it works in, inside a vector. So we want to build a class that basically does this. So I want to write a class called ArrayList. I would just call it vector, but that name is taken. If we call ours vector as well, it'll conflict and confuse the compiler. So I called it ArrayList because that's the name of the equivalent thing in Java. So I thought that might be a familiar name. And <clears throat> I want to write all of these different methods in the class for the most part. We won't have time to write all of them really thoroughly together. but. That's the plan. So whenever you're writing a class, you want to think about what variables, what uh, private member variables the thing should have inside of it. So if this is the thing we're going to represent, what do you think are the variables that we should declare inside of the array list? Or just give me one that you think might be useful. That'd be fine too. Yes? Uh, the array. OK, let's make an array, right? We need that. <laughs> OK, so an array. So if you go to our uh, project for today, 
I've got a project called ArrayList, and I've declared some files. I've declared an ArrayList.h, I've got an ArrayList.cpp, and an ArrayList client, which is the main that makes the ArrayList and uses it for, for us to test. And I've already written a little bit of code. What I've done is I've created the kind of skeleton of the ArrayList file. And so when you make an ArrayList, you would have a constructor, and you would have these member functions. And I didn't write in what private variables we would have. That's for us to decide. So you said we needed an array. And remember the syntax for an array, you say something like int star a equals new int 10, right? But uh, when you declare these member variables, you only write their names and their types. You don't actually store the values here. So you would just say like int star a, and you would delete the rest of this part. So I'm just going to say there's an array in there. I think a is a bad name. Let's call it elements. The elements of the array are stored there. So it says int star, but that means int array. Okay, array of elements. What other variables do we need? <coughs> yes? Um, that vectors, typically, you want to be able to store things other than integers. Oh, sorry. That's a good point. Sorry, I don't think I said this. It's probably buried in one of these slides somewhere. Um, Vectors can store anything, like a vector of ints, a vector of strings, a vector of doubles. That I haven't taught you how to do this brackety kind of stuff. That's something called a template. We'll get there. But just for today, let's make it only store ints, and then we'll fix it later. In fact, if you're curious, at the very end of today's slides, I talk about how to fix that. But we won't reach it in, our, in class time. So just for now, we'll say this thing is a vector of ints, array list of ints. Okay? What other variables? Yeah? The size? The size? Yeah. So... The size, you might say, well, why do we need the size? Well, because we know the array has 10 slots, I guess, so that's what we're going to set it to have. But we have to know how many of them store actual meaningful data. And we don't know that without keeping track of that as a variable. So great. So let's make int size. Uh, and I think there's a method called size. And so in order, it won't work if you have a conflict in the name. So I think I'll just call it like my size, <laughs> whatever. Um, you have to give it a unique name. So. I actually think there's one more variable we need, but it might not be obvious. Do you have a suggestion? The capacity, yeah, the length of the array. Now, in Java, if you want to know the length of an array, you can write like elements.length. But in C++, you can't do that. In fact, you can't really say elements.anything because arrays are total ass in C++. And they don't have any methods in them or anything. They're just like blobs of bytes that don't do anything. They suck. So like elements.length doesn't work. If you want to know how long the array is, you have to actually remember that yourself as a variable. So to remember that I'm going to have 10 slots, I have to keep a variable called capacity to set to 10. Why do I have to remember that? Why can't I just write 10 in my code? Because if it gets more than 10, I'm going to grow the array bigger than 10. I have to keep track of how big I grew it to. So I'll say int capacity. OK? And maybe just for consistency, I'll say like my capacity and my elements. My elements. There. So they're all my data. Um, now, these things, I did not give any values to them. So in the constructor here is where you usually give values. You can press F2 to jump from the header to the body. So I press F2, and it jumps me to ArrayList.cpp. I have to write in the constructor. So this is like when you first make a list, it should be empty. And it probably should say the you know capacity 10 or something. So what I'll do is all these variables back here, I will initialize all their values. Okay, so I'll say my elements is a new int array of size ten, and I'll put the the parentheses just so it zeros them out. I think that'd probably be easier for debugging. And then I'll say my size, and my size is zero at the start because there's nothing in the list, right? So my size is zero, and my capacity is ten, something like that. Okay, that's an initially empty list. So now we have to implement the various operations that a list that a vector uh, could support. So uh, let's think about it for a second. How do you add something to the end of the list? When you say add 42, they mean add to the end, right? So uh, in our code right now, the list starts out empty. So you might be thinking about something empty becoming non-empty, which is fine. But I also like to think about what if there's some stuff in there. Supposedly, maybe there's six elements already now, how do I put the new one you know, after all them? What kind of code do I need? What do you think? Yeah. Um, so you can say, like, the, the array as the size of your new element. OK, so go to the, in the next index, the sixth index in this case. So go to index number size, basically. 
and then set that to store the new value that they're passing in, 42. OK, great. Is there anything else I need to do? I have to increase the size to become 7, because now there are 7 things stored at indexes 0 through 6, right? So um, this method is kind of short, the add method. That's the first one here. I'll just say my elements, bracket, my size, should be set to store that value. And then I should do my size plus plus. That's it. You might have thought you need a loop or something, walk around. But we know where to go. We just jump to the end, to the size location. And that's where to put it, right? There's a particular case where this code would not do the right thing. Um, do you know what case that would be? Do you, yeah, what do you say? When size equals 10 or more. Right, once it's full, once we have all 10 slots full, this would go off the bounds of the array. In Java, when you go off the bounds of an array, do you know what it does? It's an exception, it explodes, it crashes your program. In C++, guess what happens when you go off the bounds of the array? It just keeps going. <laughs> Because what's happening is in the computer's memory, there's an array sitting there. And if you go off the bounds, it just goes to the next piece of memory. So like whatever's there, it just puts the 42 or whatever the value is in there. So fun, magical, random stuff starts happening in your program. And it could crash, or it could get corrupted, or just weird stuff could happen. And uh, so we don't want to go off the bounds of the array. If you'll permit me, what I'll say is for a few minutes, I want to leave this just like this. And we won't add more than 10 yet. I just want to test a basic adding first, and then we'll fix this issue. Yes, sir? Um, is that a threat to our computer? It's a threat to life as we know it. <laughs> uh, no, his question is, is it a threat to our computer? Well, it could crash the program, or it could corrupt the memory of the program while it was running. But in general, it cannot cause our hard drive to be erased or our operating system to be virus infected. It depends what the program's behavior is. In general, if your program starts doing random stuff, you can't be so sure of what it would do. It's probably just going to crash or just compute some junk that's not the right answer. But like, if your program's purpose is to like filter and delete certain files on your hard drive, if you junked up some of the memory, you might delete the wrong file, and that would be bad. So I mean, you don't want to do this, basically. But it's, you know, it's limited what it could do, but uh, it could be bad. So anyway, OK, so we've added to the end of the list. Let's look at a couple of other things. So there's add. Uh, what about inserting in the list, not at the end? So insert 42 at index 3. What generally do we need to do here? You don't have to give me code. Just like kind of describe what are some of the things I have to get done in order to do this. Yes? The elements on the right half of the array have to be shifted over by one index, incremented one index? Yeah, you're totally right. Uh, I have to slide over the elements to make room for the new one to be inserted at index 3. And then I just put it there, and I increase the size, and then I'll be good. Yeah, that's what I need to do. So OK, uh, there's a Socrative uh, thingy here. So I have a question for you guys. Uh, let me. Let me pop that up. Let's do a multiple choice question. And OK, so here's the question. If I'm going to slide these things over, should I start from the left part, like index, I guess, what, three or so, and push to the right? Or should I start on the right and pull people toward me and then walk to the left? Or do either of those work equally well? Vote A, B, or C. You could talk to your buddy if you want to. Go ahead. I'll give you a few more seconds, and then we'll show the votes. Here's what you think. 
pretty heavy majority for answer B, pulling, starting on the right and pulling uh, elements that way toward you. I think that's probably the right uh, way to do it. And if you think about answer A, where uh, you, where did it go? Here. If you were to start here and start pushing things, you'd probably say, oh, I need to move this 7 over, so move this here. And now I need to move this 5 over, so move this here. And now I need to move this 12 over, so move this here. And you just get a bunch of 7s. Do you understand? So if you're pushing, you're going to clobber stuff. But if you pull, instead you say, hey, I'm, I'm right here, so I need to pull this 12 over here. And then now I'm here, I need to pull this 5 over here. And now I'm here, I need to pull this 7 over here. You see, that way it works better. It doesn't clobber. So um, it's not too hard to write this code. We just have to make sure to get the bounds right. When I look at the picture and the red part I was doodling on, if I'm inserting at 3, I should start at like 6 and pull things toward me by 1. And the last time I do that is at 4. I need to pull the 7 over to index 4. So it's kind of like from the end down to the index to insert plus 1 kind of is where I need to pull. So um, I think the code for insertion looks something like uh, for loop int i equals size, my size, and then uh, go down as long as we're greater than the index to insert at, and let's do i minus minus. And what we'll do is we'll pull the element to the left of us into our slot. That's what we're going to do. So the element to the left of me is at index i minus 1, or no, wait. I want to make me become the one who's to the left of me, which is that, right? Grab the one left of me and pull that here. And that's making a gap. Okay. Then once we're done with that, at this index, I want to insert this value. So let's do my elements uh, bracket index equals value. And then we also have to do one more thing, which is what? My size plus plus, just like when we add, this is a new element. We have to increase the size by one. So that's insertion. I think the hardest thing about this code is just, A, just kind of knowing which direction to walk, and B, like these, it's really easy to get these bounds like off by one, and then you pulled one element too many. But I'm pretty sure we have them right. We can test it in a second. Do you guys kind of get what we're doing here so far? I mean, we're building our own crappy <laughs> version of vector right now, right? And so far we can create it, and we can add or insert in it. Up to 10 things. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> awesome. It's like having a piggy bank that only stores 10 coins or something. You know, your parents are like, you're managing your own money now. Well, OK, thanks. Um, questions so far? Does this kind of make sense? I mean, maybe one, one thing that might be helpful is like to think about the other perspective. Like this thing, this whole file that we're writing, is not a full program, it's a library. We're writing something that can be used by programs to implement code. So like you would use this thing uh, if you had a client program like this that had your main method in it. <clears throat> your main method might create array lists and do things to them, and maybe that's your behavior. Like test add says, well, I'm going to add some stuff, and then I'm going to print the list, and then I'm going to insert some stuff, and I'm going to print the list. And so I think we could run this test right now and just do test add and see if that worked. Um, the only thing is right here we try to print the list, and that requires that overloaded operator, and we didn't really write that yet. So that's maybe the next thing we could do, because I think if you're building a collection, you kind of need to be able to create it and put things in it and then see what you put in it. <laughs> that's kind of the, the minimal state of a collection for it to be useful, right? So if I go back to ArrayList.cpp, we do have an operator uh, less than less than, right? And it takes an ArrayList parameter. So if you were just going to print the elements of, of a vector or something, how would you do that? I mean, that's basically what we need to do, except instead of C out, we'll just say out, right? How do you do it? What do you say? How about a for loop? Do a loop over the elements? Okay. So you might say like four int i is zero, i is less than my size, uh, i plus plus. You know, some people get confused, should I use my size or my capacity? 
and it should be the size, right? Because if your array stores 10, but you've only added four things, I don't want to print the other six. The other six are just useless zeros that don't mean anything. So my size, and then you'd probably say like out bracket uh, list, or not list, uh, my elements bracket I bracket comma, something like that. Um, this doesn't quite work. This code is the right idea, but it doesn't quite work. The reason it doesn't work is because these operators are technically not inside of the array list, so it's not allowed to look at these private variables here. Like if you remember how operators get declared, this is the end of the array list class right there, and then the oper operator comes there after, outside of that. Therefore, just because of that, it means that this thing can't reach in and see these variables. So look, let's provide a way that the user, that the outside code can see the size of the list and can see the contents of element i. So how would I do that? Well, let's write a method called size. So let's write size that returns my size, okay? And for getting element i, we can just go up here and write a method called get, <laughs> takes an index, and then I will return my elements bracket index. Okay, so those are just ways for the external code to do loops over the data now, okay? So now down here, instead of my size, I'll write list.size, and instead of my elements i, I'll say list.get i. Now, uh, on the real vector, you could say like list bracket i. Oops, I, I don't know what that did, but you could say list bracket i. Uh, we can't do that yet. That's overloading the bracket bracket operator, which I don't <laughs> want to do right now, but you could do that if you wanted to. Okay, so now I think we have a, a printer Thing. Uh, we do have a bug where there's a comma after the last element, but maybe just for a minute I'll leave that and I'll compile. And I'll run. And what happens? Well, I added some stuff and it looks like it's there. And I inserted some I mean, you can't tell if this is the right output without looking at the main program. So let me pop up the main program. So I add 42, negative 5, 17, and 28, size 4. So that looks pretty good. Then I do insert and I insert what, 111 at index one, so that went there and it made size five, that looks pretty good. We do 444 at index four, that's right there. We do zero at index zero, that goes there, and we do 7777 at index seven, that goes there, and yeah. I, think, I think so far so good, it's kind of working, right? Um, let's look at one or two more operations in the time that we have left, unless there's a question first. You guys okay? Um, so here are some of the other members we might want to write. So we wrote size, we wrote get. How about set index value? That's where they say set the, this index to store this value. Slightly different than inserting, right? Insert means slide over and make room. Set means go there, there's already something there, and I'm going to clobber it and replace it with a new value. So that's not too hard to write. If you're going to set the value, that's just right here. You just go to my elements bracket index and set that equal to the value that they passed in, right? So that's not so bad. Uh, all of these methods are like assuming that the indexes are not out of bounds, right? That's maybe a little sloppy on our part, but we might want to have to come back to that in a little while. Um, is empty, you can ask whether the list is empty, right? That's not very hard. So back here we go is empty. Right now it just says false, but is empty just means that your size is zero, right? If your size zero, then your list is empty. That's not so hard. Um, Two string operator, we did operator waka waka, we don't need two string, those are basically the same. So, okay, we've got a lot of different things here. Um, let's talk about remove, this is listed as a Socratic, but I think that uh, since I did the other one, I can skip this one. So, removing, if we were removing the value at index two, like this nine here, I gotta shift all the elements over to, to cover it up, right? So maybe just somebody tell me verbally, like, should I start on the right and push to the left, or should I start on the left and pull to the right? Which one would you do? The first one or the second one? Start on the left, because you're always like freeing up space for, as you're moving from left to right, you're always freeing up space for the next variable to, to pop over. Right, start at, the, start at index two here and pull the seven in there and then pull the five in there and then pull the 12 in there. If we start over here and we push the 12 there and then we try to push the five there, oops, the 12 is a five now. So we're just gonna push a bunch of 12s, it'll probably clobber things. So yeah, just it's kind of the opposite. When we did add, we started over here on the right and pulled things toward us. Over here we start on the left and pull things toward us. So same idea, I think we wanna loop from uh, the index of insertion up to size minus one and pull something like that. So 
I think removing from a, an array list is like for int i equals index, i is less than size, my size, and i plus plus. And each of those times we want to pull the element from the right toward our index. So our index should become what was stored to the right by one. Right? And if you think about this carefully, on the very last pass of this loop, i will be my size minus one, right? That's the last time the loop will actually go. And I, my size minus one is going to be five. So in that last pass, it will grab this zero and pull that zero over there. So this will become a zero. So I guess that's OK. Yeah? So far, so good. We can add, we can remove, we can get, we can set. We're awesome. I'm the king of the world. And it has nothing to do with this 10th Red Bull that I've had today. <laughs> I didn't used to like these things. In fact, they taste horrible, but I can't stop drinking them for some reason now. <laughs> Go figure. Maybe they're highly addictive. I don't know. Um, pro the real problem is my fiance got a Costco membership, and now she brings home like 5,000 of them in a big crate. <laughs> so they're just sitting there in front of me. I can't resist. Um, OK, let's talk about one more thing. Let's talk about running out of space. I've only got a couple minutes left. So I didn't like ignoring that issue about running out of space. If I add more than 10 elements, what will happen? Well, it'll crash, right? Or it'll do bad stuff. What I really should do is, if the array gets full, I should grow the array, right? And well, when should I do that? When in the code should I possibly grow this array? Where should that happen? When I'm adding or when I'm inserting. Those are the two places where the array might need to get bigger, right? So here's what I think you should do for this. I think you should go back to your h file, and you've got all these methods. You can write methods beyond these. Maybe we'll write a helper method called like check if I need to resize or not, because <laughs> I might want to call that from add and from insert, right? So I don't want the outside uh, main method guy calling that. I just want my code to call that. So why don't I make that a private method? So down here, I'll say something like void, check, resize. OK, so I'll check if I need to do a resize or not. And now the implementation of that will be somewhere down here at the bottom of my file. I'll say void, array, list, check, resize. And then in here, I'll say, well, if I'm out of space, get bigger. And before I write that, just I hope it's clear, the, the point of this would be like up in the add code. I just jumped up there. I'd say check, resize. Check to see if I need to resize. And then the assumption is that after that, I will have space to do this. OK? And same thing when I insert. I'll check if I need to resize first. So I'll just assume that method is going to take care of all that business. OK? So down here, how do I know if I need to resize or not according to the values of these variables here? If what? If the capacity is equal to the size, right? So if my size has gotten as large as my capacity, then here's what I'll do. I'll make a bigger array that's twice as big as my current one. You might have thought I would put bracket 20, but later it might need to be 40, 60, 80. I'll just double it. Make it twice as big. That's a good amount to resize it to. Now I make the array bigger. I have to copy all the old stuff into the new one. So for each element, my size, store in the bigger array at index i what was stored in my elements bracket i. OK, so I'm copying it over. Now that I've copied it over, I want to make my object use that bigger array in the future. So I'll say my elements should become the bigger array. OK, so now my array will be the bigger one. Now. There is one problem here. Remember all that deleting stuff I talked about? If I do this, I will lose the old smaller array without deleting it, without freeing it up. And that would be one of those memory leaks we talked about. So right before I choose to start using the bigger array, I'll say delete the memory for the old smaller array of elements, then set it to store the new bigger one. Do you understand? So that way, when I jump up from 10 to 20, I clean up the 10 element array first, so I won't leak my memory out. 